Now it's time for lawsuits. Cheeto says he's gonna sue. Okay, fun's over. I ran this joke into the ground a long time ago. Let's just get to the ending. After regrouping, the gang gives a 20 minute explanation for everything that just happened before moving on to the next topic. Who is Akechi working for? There's no way he's acting on his own accord, as the mental shutdown assassinations are too coordinated and purposeful. He was reporting to someone about his plans for the Phantom Thieves, so he can't be the person making these decisions. In one of Akechi's phone calls, a name is dropped. Shido. Sojiro instantly makes the connection. Masayoshi Shido, the current frontrunner for Prime Minister, with election day not even a month away. Oh, yeah, uh, Sojiro knows they're the Phantom Thieves now. It happened last month, but I cut it for time and because it's not, like, vital to understand the through line of the story. I will say it hurt to cut because I used it as an excuse to talk about this character I genuinely love but don't get to talk about much. Shido, who's been furthering his political career with the research he stole from Wakaba after orchestrating her death, planned to use the downfall of the Phantom Thieves as both a way to regain soul control over the metaverse, as well as one last tool that would win him the role of Prime Minister. We test to see if he has a palace, and what do you know, there it is at the Diet Building. But there's a problem. We don't know the keyword. While trying to figure this out, Ryuji runs off to confront Shido after we overhear him campaigning nearby. While we try to pry him off, Joker comes to the realization that he is the same politician who drunkenly tried to rape a woman and had him arrested for putting a stop to it. Damn brat! I'll sue! You cannot put this one on me, okay? The game did it this time, I had nothing to do with this, I didn't even know this happened! Following multiple days of attempting to guess the keyword, Joker is finally able to piece it together based off various sound bites he's personally heard from Shido. Ship. Finally, they're able to get into his palace, discovering how the man truly sees Japan. A nation on the verge of destruction, with him in charge of the yacht, casually sailing through its ruins. After doing some recon and learning how to get into Shido's treasure chamber, we retreat and make plans to move forward. Before we head back in, Kasumi comes to visit us at LeBlanc. While I do actually like how the scene itself is written, I feel it's brought down by the contrived explanation for why Kasumi was in Sai's palace in the first place. She followed us because she thought something weird was going on. It just feels like forced reasoning to insert her into the prologue while also keeping her out of the main team until the new year. Beyond that, the scene is nice, showing how she does care about Joker and even getting to see her meet and interact with Futaba. Since we found the treasure chamber immediately, the main goal of Shido's palace is to collect five letters of introduction in order to get inside. While obtaining these letters, we learn more about what Shido has done, ordering mental shutdowns on behalf of others in a deal to get wealthy backers, paying off TV networks so they would air whatever he wanted so he could control the narrative, and we even meet the guy responsible for pretending to be Medjed and hacking into the fan site, rigging the polls. It's also revealed that Kanashiro and Madarame were in Shido's back pocket, further tying everything together and making Kamoshida the only palace ruler who just seems to have nothing to do with anything. It's actually a little weird. Structurally, it's sound on paper, but in practice, I find its execution repetitive. This is echoed by the level design, which, when you're not solving a puzzle, is mainly just a bunch of hallways with little interesting going on. You basically end up doing the same cycle five times over. Run through a few straight-as-a-whistle hallways, solve a puzzle, find the NPC that gives you the letter of introduction, watch a cutscene, fight a mini-boss, repeat. While every palace has its formula, I think with how much it's repeated here, it's so much more noticeable. The main puzzle gimmick has us turning into mice when around these Shido statues. The justification for this, that being Shido sees any invaders as mice, is really, really basic and feels like it could have fit in anyone's palace, making its placement here feel really arbitrary and lacking in creativity when compared to past puzzles that either took advantage of the palace's theme or were appropriate to how the ruler was characterized. Futaba's palace had puzzles that played around with the idea that this was a tomb filled with traps to keep invaders out. 
Sai's palace had puzzles that were all rigged games of chance and skill that reflected her desire to win at all costs. Turning into mice doesn't really have much to do with the yacht aesthetics, beyond rats sneaking onto boats being a major issue throughout the course of history. But those were rats, not mice. And as I said before, I feel like the attempt to justify it with Shido's worldview is pretty rudimentary. That reasoning could be used for almost any of the palace rulers we've come across, and it would have fit just as well, excluding Futaba. The good news then is that these puzzles are actually really, really cool. Level design here gets more intricate, requiring you to turn the statues on and off strategically. While you can't open doors as a mouse, you can crawl through the super tiny ventilation. It can get a little tiring having to double back over and over again to keep flipping the same on and off switch, but overall, I think this is actually a pretty creative and fun puzzle type. In terms of differences between vanilla and royal, the only notable change is how royal adds cheese that allows you to heal your mouse party. I like Shido's Palace. While it struggles with repetition, the puzzle type itself is actually a lot of fun and is a genuine brain teaser. It also helps that I love the yacht aesthetic. Some of my favorite dungeons and RPGs share it. What holds Shido's back, however, is how it doesn't feel like it takes advantage of being set on a yacht outside of the opening chamber, the hallway on the side of the boat, and the rooms where all you do is find a specific NPC. The vast majority of the time, you're running around the same looking hallways that get old pretty quickly. While trying to get one of the letters, the girls are pushed to dress up in bathing suits to get its owner to hand it over, and there's a complete roller coaster of emotions in the span of three minutes. At first, it feels like a gross repeat of the gang pressuring on to strip nude for Yusuke back in May, only to subvert that by having the guy reject the girls for not being of noble blood only to then double back and do the trope anyway by having him creep on on when she's lying to him. Personally, I don't think it's as bad as the stripping scene in May, as it does allow On to develop as a character with her somewhat improved acting, as well as her confidence in doing this. But I still come out of this scene with a sigh of disappointment and annoyance. This still wasn't the girl's idea, and they were pressured to do this by Ryuji and the boys. Not to mention, just the tropey nature of it all is just so... It's, it, it, I see this stuff and I just think it's so juvenile and just annoying and stupid. After we get all five letters of introduction, we are ambushed by Akechi, who has figured out we fake Joker's death. During the encounter, he finally shows us his true self. Born the bastard child of Shido, he went through years of suffering as his mother was cast aside by the father, resorting to sex work before dying while Akechi was still young. Blaming his father for his mother's death and even his own birth, he makes plans for revenge, work for Shido, and build up his political career via assassinating his enemies in the metaverse before using it to control his father and ruin his life while he's at the top. After the fight, Akechi gets jumped by a cognitive version of himself, who reveals Shido knew who he was and his intentions all along, planning to get rid of him once he was no longer of any use. Locking himself behind a bulkhead, Akechi is implied to have been killed by his cognitive self, his life signs disappearing from Futaba's radar. God. Fuck. Akechi. Whiny, edgy-ass bitch. He was genuinely more interesting when he was a calm and collected detective who thought he was righteous in his justice. I'm not trying to quote Family Guy here, but the game insists upon itself with him. It thinks what it's doing is so much better written than it actually is. As he reveals more and more of his story, his true personality comes out, revealing him to be a murderous, raving lunatic his outfit transforming into the black mass villain we've been hearing about the entire game. This transformation, his facial expressions, the way he holds himself like he's going insane, how the camera frames him, the Phantom Thieves hyping him up by talking about how strong and tragic he is, spelling out exactly how I should feel about this character. The game is trying so hard to make you think he's this horrifying, wretched figure that you should actually feel sympathetic for, despite all of this coming out in the last minute via telling and not showing. Let's also not forget the fact that he murdered an unknown number of people, including the parents of two of our members, with no signs of regret. 
I know Haru says she can't forgive him for killing her dad, but the game feels like it's trying everything in its power to make you want him back on the team. No, I don't feel bad about him potentially dying. I'm not letting this go. No amount of telling me he's tragic will change how I feel about him when you spent the entire game showing me the outcome of all of the horrible actions he's directly responsible for on the behest of Shido. No amount of the Phantom Thieves feeling bad for him will make me agree with them offering to let him help take down his father. This feels like an incredibly edgy anime from a decade ago, and it's just so stupid. To be clear, this is not my opinion of Akechi as a whole. While I wrote a lot of hate-filled notes when playing this sequence at 3 in the morning, I feel I've since been able to approach this with a much more leveled head. When I started this with Fuck Akechi, I more so meant in this moment specifically. Prior to this, I actually liked him quite a bit. Even the concepts being presented in this scene are good on paper. The parallels between Akechi and Joker are obvious and are repeatedly hammered in in Akechi's new confidant, which I also think does a lot in humanizing him and does a lot of the lead work at making you sympathize with him. My problems lie entirely with how these ideas are being presented and the way the game is so confident that I'm going to believe the hype and feel bad for Akechi while not doing anywhere near a good enough job at tilting that scale. If you like this scene, more power to you, but everything about this sequence just does not work for me. I take that back. Robbie Damon does a fantastic job. He is at no fault for any of this. He did everything he needed to do perfectly. Well, now that we're done with that rant, we head on home and send out the calling card in a huge way. Hacking into the TV broadcast signal and telling everyone in Japan of our intentions. Shido is pissed, and the police are rushing. Sojiro is arrested while playing ignorant, Sai pretends to have not been involved, and we even get a few scenes of our maxed out confidants reacting to the news. I honestly love this moment because of how much of a middle finger it is. Shido is a complete bastard and the worst of all the villains we've dealt with so far. So the announcement of our survival and intentions is so satisfying. Upon reaching his treasure room, Shadow Shido brings us up to the top of the ship where he transforms, starting the first of a five-phase battle. There is a lot to talk about here, and it's all rad as fuck. The first phase has Shido riding on a lion made of people called the Beast of Human Sacrifice. This first phase doesn't have a lot that's super threatening. Repelling physical attacks, the most dangerous strategy he has is Wage War, which can inflict rage on your party members and cause them to attack the beast and ultimately damage themselves. It does have an attack called Arm of Destruction, but simply guarding is enough to deal with it. Its second phase has the beast sprouting wings, transforming it into the wings of human sacrifice. Rather than repelling physical attacks, this time it resists all magic, completely flipping the script from phase one. Its unique attack is Royal Wing Beam, but much like Arm of Destruction, I didn't find it that dangerous. Beyond that, it mainly focuses on using single target magic attacks. The third phase has Shido's Bird Lion transform into the all-seeing eye of Providence, the Tomb of Human Sacrifice, complete with cannons in the form of its eyes. This form packs a punch, cycling through two super strong almighty attacks. It's here where I started to trip up, but by the time you see this thing, Shida will have such little health, it's basically just a matter of taking it down before it can wipe you out. Once his ride has been destroyed, the battle technically starts over, with Shadow Shido abandoning his fancy chariot and char asnable cosplay, going back to his hotel room so he can throw on his Senator Armstrong outfit. In Vanilla P5, this phase focused mostly on buffs and debuffs matched with physical attacks that can do a ton of damage. His final phase has him making full use of his nano machines, gaining both single target and multi target magic attacks. Once his health is low enough, he'll start using Tyrant's Glare to buff himself and debuff your party before hitting you with Tyrant's Wave. In Royal, the 4th and 5th phases are reworked pretty extensively, and are pretty damn tough. The 4th form still buffs him with Heat Riser, but it also likes to make use of the move Tyrant's Purge, 
which is an insta-kill bless attack. The fifth form, meanwhile, has an absolutely massive list of skills, combining the last phase's skill list with just about every magic attack you can think of, plus a few new ones exclusive to this fight. Finally, when his health is low enough, he'll force a one-on-one -on -one with Joker that has him cycling through his skills in a set order. This fight is insanely good and is probably my favorite in the game. It is long, but it's an incredibly satisfying challenge that has you coming out of it feeling like you fought your ass off to take down the man responsible for basically everything in the game. Capping all of this off is the best song in the game, Rivers in the Desert. Rivers in a dry land, the last days in a lost land, with the hope of new beginnings burned our feet. Now we need it, a heartbeat for a teen man, oasis in a teen land. Remind us what we're here for Creating the life Creating rivers in the desert Realizing we've won, Shido takes a medicine that induces a temporary death in an effort to erase his palace with us still in it. As the yacht sinks faster than we can run, Ryuji notices a lifeboat hanging onto its suspension the lever to let it down sitting at the top of the sinking front half of the ship. He prepares to sprint for both his and his friend's lives, long jumping across the wreckage, climbing up a vertical slope, and pulling the lever. As everyone gets onto the lifeboat, the ship explodes, taking Ryuji with it. Outside of the Diet Building, everyone mourns the loss of Ryuji, barely even able to acknowledge their success. Ryuji walks up, safe and sound, unaware of the team's tears, and in response, the Phantom Thieves proceed to beat him up for it. Do I need to say it? I feel like even vehement defenders of this game acknowledge how bad this scene is. It completely undermines what should be Ryuji's best moment in the game, forcing him back into the role of comedic relief in a moment where everyone should be celebrating him as a hero. It's bad. Really bad. But it also kind of feels like the game knows this. Once Ryuji walks up, it feels like the game is trying to speed run the joke and get this scene over with. I can't force myself to hate it as much as it really deserves just because it's over as quickly as Ryuji ran. The night after our victory against Shido, Morgana has that dream again. He sits there on the bed, ruminating, questioning his existence and his relationship with Mementos. Time for confidants! Caroline Justine, maxed out. Takemi, maxed out. Ryuji, maxed out. On, maxed out. Yusuke, maxed out. Makoto, maxed out. And Romance, screw the haters, I like her. Futaba, maxed out on the last possible day to have any impact on confidants. Haru, maxed out. And finally, I spent my last remaining bit of free time in base Persona 5 hanging out with Sojiro the man I wish I got to spend more time with. The game did not think I would do his rank two on the last possible day of the game because he tells me to get settled in at LeBlanc. If Joker isn't settled in after eight months, he probably just doesn't like it here. Election day comes and everyone votes for Shido, having him win in a landslide. But during his acceptance speech, he admits to everything he's done, including having Okumura murdered and manipulating the media to spin it as the Phantom Thieves' fault. Shido is a character that's incredibly easy to hate. He thinks he's owed his position in life, that he was chosen to be at the top of the food chain, and that anyone he has killed is but an inevitable sacrifice justified by him getting to where he's supposed to be. Everything we learn about this man is just deplorable. He's the source of practically every trouble the gang has dealt with over the last eight months. And when he's not, he's usually in cahoots with the source, enabling that behavior. Matarame and Kaneshiro back Shido's campaign financially. He's the one that ordered the deaths of Wakaba and Okumura. And of course, he's the one who put Joker in this situation in the first place. However, I wouldn't exactly say he's a deep character. 
He's incredibly one note, acting as nothing more than a misanthropic, narcissistic sociopath. And honestly, that's totally fine. He has a specific purpose in the story and he's used perfectly. As I mentioned before, I like his palace, though I honestly like it less than I did back in 2017. Its repetitive nature has it outstaying its welcome, while also feeling like there's missed potential. For me, a lot of it is carried by the solid puzzles, fantastic music, and probably the best boss fight in the game. This story arc also plays host to some of the lowest points in the plot, some of which I'm confident most will agree with, while others I'm confident most will want to tear my guts out and use it to recreate my desktop wallpaper. As the penultimate palace in base Persona 5, I think Shido's palace is up there with the good ones. However, I feel it still pales in comparison with the best the game has to offer. What did you guys think of Shido's Palace? Let me know down in the comments below, and while you're there, subscribe and hit the bell to be notified of future upload. Why is there still a massive chunk of the video left? What do you mean no one cares about Shido's admission of guilt? No, 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 we stole his heart. He admitted to his crimes. That means he's going down, right? He'll be investigated by the government. He won't be prime minister and everyone will celebrate us for it. The truth is that changing Shido's heart wouldn't have solved anything. Shido wasn't some solo actor. He was supported by an entire conspiracy's worth of people equally as corrupt as him, riding his coattails to the top. They wouldn't allow him to go down so easily as it would ruin them all. Behind the scenes, they make plans to fight back against Sai's criminal investigation, as well as Shido's own desire to atone. Sai is completely shut out. Shido is put under medical watch and isn't allowed to say or do anything. The fact of the matter is that this issue is systematic. Taking out the head doesn't do anything. The Hydra will just keep growing back more. The only way to stop it is to sear the neck shut through the power of the people. But no one cares. The Phantom Thieves are being treated like they don't exist. No one cares about Shido's confession. They're moving on as if nothing happened at all. The people have become complacent with society. Doing anything is too much trouble. The truth is they never cared about justice or change. The Phantom Thieves were just entertainment. Morgana comes up with a plan that could maybe make people care. Steal the treasure at the bottom of Mementos, the People's Palace. However, doing so will have massive ramifications. Mementos acts as the source of the collective unconscious in the metaverse. When someone creates a palace, their cognition is born out of it. If we steal the treasure, Mementos will collapse like every other palace, and the metaverse will cease to exist. This scenario held so much more weight back in 2017 when we didn't have multiple P5 spinoffs that take place after this. Honestly, even back then, it's arguable if it held weight because we already knew that they were going to be milking the shit out of this game. We head to the entrance to Mementos. The cutscene empties us out onto the first floor. We turn around, go back to the entrance, and warp our way to the end. There, we enter the final palace in vanilla Persona 5. The Depths of Mementos. The bad news, you have to complete the entire palace in one day. The good news, you can leave whenever you want to heal and stock up on items. This is good because not only are you able to grind for money so you can go and buy the best equipment, but I also got so caught up in the moment that I forgot to do any kind of preparation before this. The level design here is pretty basic, though the aesthetics are really cool. It almost feels like it was ripped right out of SMT Nocturne. The puzzles are fun, if simple. However, I don't know if they feel like the kind of puzzle you'd expect out of a final dungeon. Honestly, this whole place is just really short. It takes like an hour max to get through. Compared to Sai and Shido's palace, it's like a third of the length. I don't have much to say about it, I don't know what to tell you. Here in the depths, people have locked themselves inside cages with no desire to leave. We even find that Kamoshida, Madarame, Kanashiro, and Shido have made their way back here, now beckoning us to join them. They see life outside of the prison as a hell that's not worth living in. The cage is comforting. 
There's no need to desire, no need to fight. Just be passive. Don't worry, you have your lot in life. Don't shake the boat. Anyone who does escape creates a palace, only to go back to their cage willingly once the phantom thieves change their hearts. But if the people want to stay in the cages and be oppressed by the guards, who's in charge here? Morgana is on edge. He's seen this place before. It's where he first came to and realized he was different from the humans. This is what he escaped from. Once we reach the bottom of the depths and find the treasure, we attempt to smash this giant structure. However, no matter what we do, the prisoners keep worshipping it, giving it life. The treasure starts talking, revealing itself to have taken on the form of the Holy Grail. It looks to grant the people's wish to be controlled and led. Rather than put in the effort themselves, they'd rather waste away and just hope things get better for them. In order to grant this wish, the Holy Grail starts to merge the metaverse with the real world, giving it power over not just the populace's cognition, but their physical being as well. After being ejected back into Shibuya, the metaverse starts to encroach on Tokyo. However, the only people who notice it are those connected to the Phantom Thieves. In other words, Mishima, Sojiro, Sai, and whatever confidants you have maxed out. As the metaverse grows stronger, the Phantom Thieves start to disappear, because the people are starting to forget about the Thieves. They now cease to exist. Igor calls Joker into the Velvet Room and deems his rehabilitation a failure due to the people not allowing it. Igor orders Joker to be executed for this, but the twins relent after Joker continues to fight and their conscience weighs them down. A voice rings out and the twins realize what they once were, a single person who was divided by Igor. They ask Joker to fuse them together, recreating the Velvet Room attendant, Lavenza. Igor reveals himself to have actually been the Holy Grail the entire time. Now believing himself to be a god of control, he attempted to use Joker to change humanity's tendency for apathy and spur them to want for genuine change. To do this, he took control of the Velvet Room, sealed away the real Igor, and split Lavenza into two beings, making her subservient and ignorant. To decide the fate of the world, the Grail chose two champions. One would incite distortions and lead the world to be destroyed if victorious while the other, a trickster, would fight against this, inspire the populace, and save them. These champions would be Goro Akechi and Joker, respectively. With Joker's failure, Igor now gives him the option to return the world to the way it was, with the Phantom Thieves being made famous and the world full of corruption. Joker rejects it, leaving the Grail to destroy humanity. While I take issue with the Akechi twist and how obvious it was written, I honestly have nothing but praise for the Lavenza and Igor twists. The foreshadowing for Lovenza is mainly found in two areas, the occasional visit from the Butterfly and in Caroline and Justine's Confidant. One complaint many fans of the original Persona trilogy have for the modern games is how hesitant they are to include characters and aspects of the PS1 games. If you didn't know any better, you'd think Igor was the master of the Velvet Room, when in reality he is just a servant for its true master, Philemon. While Philemon isn't important to the plots of the Hishino games, he is still present in his butterfly form. However, in Persona 5, they use any previous understanding of the butterfly to play with a veteran's expectations, revealing that this one was actually Lavenza calling out to Joker for help, completely subverting your expectations. While it's disappointing that this results in P5 being the one mainline entry in which Philemon is just completely absent, I think from a narrative perspective, this is actually incredibly clever. Couple this with Caroline and Justine's confidant, which has them discovering these strange documents of unknown origin that slowly makes them start questioning their existence, making for a really cool plot twist. Now, as for Igor, this was genius. For context, between the release of Persona 4 and 5, Igor's Japanese voice actor, Isamu Tanonaka, passed away forcing Atlas to recast when P5 came around. However, when this new voice was revealed, it was incredibly different from the Igor people knew. Rather than it being the higher-pitched, nasally voice we know, we got a deeper, almost sinister one that was being put through a filter. In my opinion, this alone is all that was needed to set up and foreshadow the twist that this wasn't Igor. By working with the hand they were dealt, they made the best of a bad situation by disguising all of this as simply a change in direction for Igor's voice. Back when I first played P5, I did question the voice before quickly getting used to it. 
I stopped questioning it by the time I finished the first palace. I was just so caught up in Kamoshida that it didn't matter to me anymore. Once I got to this twist, I was genuinely caught off guard. To this day, I hold this as the best written twist in Persona 5. What Atlas did here was amazing. But if I had one nitpick, it would be the real Igor's dialogue. Shortly after the Grail disappears, the real Igor is returned to the room, complete with a voice that's much more akin to what you'd expect. That's because in Japanese, they reused past Isamu Tanonaka clips, while in English, they translated the reused clips and re-recorded them with Kurt Thornton, who was replacing the previous English Igor voice actor, Dan Warren. The problem I have here is how vague and generic this dialogue is. While the context of it being reused audio perfectly justifies why what Igor says feels so inspecific to the conversation, it still comes off as awkward in the English translation that didn't reuse any audio. I kind of wish Atlas West had rewritten this dialogue so that Igor felt like he was actually a part of the conversation, but given why this all happened in the first place, I'm willing to let it slide and consider this a nitpick. Regardless, Lavenza encourages Joker to release his friends from their cages. What follows is a nice sequence that reaffirms the core of each character's arc. While it is somewhat repetitive, it acts as a nice reminder of what these characters are about, especially since for some, it's been multiple in-game months since it was explored. Once they're released, Morgana reappears and reveals himself to have been a creation of the real Igor, made to assist the trickster in defeating the Grail. As time went on, the Grail itself would become distorted, concluding that humanity is incapable of change and thus preventing it in the first place. I've alluded to this in past videos, and now is finally time to talk about it. The Grail is apathy incarnate. While at one point it might have desired genuine change, it festering at the bottom of an oppressive society distorted it, transforming it into a disgusting, oil-covered machine that does nothing but sit there. The cogs on its side rotate, but they are nothing more than a do-nothing machine, rotating bars around the cup with no purpose. It sits there, accepting what it's given. Yet ironically, despite being the manifestation of the public's indifference, it's empowered by this lack of care, using it to prop itself up as the new god of control. The reason why Kamoshida was able to get away with sexual assault and abuse was because no one with the power to do something about it bothered to step up. His actions were an open secret. Ryuji was injured to the point that he could no longer run track without injuring himself further. Mishima was beaten regularly simply so Kamoshida could have something to let his anger out on. An was sexually harassed with a simple denial leading to Shiho getting raped and attempting suicide. Everyone knew. But the principal did nothing. The faculty did nothing. They were all complicit in his terror because it was easier to let it be while they reaped the benefits with no effort on their end. This is what Persona 5 is about at its core. It's a request for people to care about these issues and to use their place in society to stand up against injustice. Do not take the easy path when that path comes at the cost of the oppression of others. Do not turn your eye when a social issue is staring you straight in the face. It is your duty as a human being to sympathize with your fellow man and be willing to fight for genuine change. Politics is a divisive, horribly toxic subject that many people would prefer to avoid entirely. Some only care when it comes to how it affects them and their own kin. Others become so beaten down that they prefer to simply coast through life, letting the world push and pull them however it wants because fighting against the tide is futile. But the truth of the matter is this lack of care is what allows these horrible people to gain their positions in the first place. The system is shaped by the people regardless of their desire to interact with it. It is not inherently corrupt. It only ends up that way through neglect. 
This is the point of Persona 5. It's asking you to care about social issues. It's asking you to care about politics. It's asking you to care about people. Exiting out of the Velvet Room, we enter into what is technically the final dungeon, but I just think of it as the last act of the Depths of Mementos. The Clyfoth world is even shorter than the Depths, and it's made up exclusively of enemy encounters. No puzzles, no platforming, nothing. Just fighting your way to the top, pretty straightforward. Once we make it to the Grail, it dons an even newer name, Yaldabaoth. Yaldi here is a tricky fight worthy of being the final boss, though I honestly think it's easier than Shadow Shido. Yaldi's main gimmick is the summoning of four weapons, the Gun of Execution, the Bell of Declaration, the Sword of Conviction, and the Book of Commandments. Each weapon has its own health, stats, affinities, and set of skills. The Gun of Execution specializes in, you guessed it, gun damage, as well as using Distorted Lust, an almighty attack that inflicts lust to a party member, and Distorted Avarice, which reduces the target's HP by 50% and inflicts hunger. The Bell of Declaration focuses on defense buffs and debuffs, as well as using Distorted Vanity, which makes the target weak to all affinities for one turn, and Distorted Envy, which inflicts jealousy, making a party member hurt another for assisting an ally. On the right side of the boss, the Sword of Conviction deals physical damage while doubling the cost of skills for a turn with Distorted Gluttony. Finally, the Book of Commandments focuses on dealing magic damage, as well as inflicting wrath with Distorted Wrath while countering any attacks with Distorted Pride. Once his health is low enough, Yaldabaoth will fully restore all four weapons and start charging for Rays of Control, an incredibly deadly attack that could easily wipe you out. Like I said before, this fight isn't that hard, but it is tricky. It's more so about understanding the current situation each turn and responding accordingly. Much like with Shido, it's also a long fight, but unlike Shido, there are no checkpoints. It might take a few tries, especially with Rays of Control being as deadly as it is, but if you're prepared, you'll take down Yaldi with ease. Yaldabaoth, also known as the Demiurge, is the False God. Being born to the goddess Sophia, it remained ignorant to the presence of its fellow deities, thus believing itself to be the one true god that created the universe. When it attempted to create humanity, he was unable to give the husk life. His mother, pitying him, granted the body a soul, creating Adam. In certain interpretations, he is also known as Samael, which in P5 is the true name for Shadow Shido. Basically, all of this is Gnosticism trying to explain Judaism while also mocking their god like it was an ancient Wojak meme. Before Yaldabaoth is defeated, he performs one last raise of control, which utterly destroys the Phantom Thieves, leaving them unable to fight. However, as we worked our way through the Clyfoth, people slowly started to realize the situation they're in, finally remembering the Phantom Thieves and truly wishing for change. The power of the people flows into Joker, allowing him to manifest his ultimate persona, Satanael, which destroys Yaldabaoth in a single shot. As Yaldi disappears, the metaverse fades from existence, restoring the world to the way it was and taking Morgana with it. The thieves mourn the loss of their dear friend and highly profitable mascot, deciding to live on in the world he left them with. Before Joker can head home, however, Psy corners him and requests that he turn himself in, as doing so would not only protect his friends, but it would also allow him to testify against Shido. It's here where the story of Persona 5 splits off, depending on the version you're playing and whether or not you've completed the requirements to unlock the third semester content. In the original P5, Joker goes with Psy, his fellow Phantom Thieves and maxed out confidants working to prove his innocence. Eventually, they are successful and are able to get him released a month later. That same day, Morgana shows back up, revealing that while he's lost his metaverse form, he's still able to exist in his cat form, thanks to his friends keeping him in their minds. While I understand why it doesn't happen in Royal, I actually really miss this part of the story. I love how everyone you've been working with over the last eight months tries to return your kindness by working to get you out of prison. Not only is it really heartwarming, but it's an example of the power of friendship trope that I really like. Normally, I 
hate this trope due to how easily it's abused and misunderstood. To me, the power of friendship is a more personal version of the power of teamwork. To make it work, you need to show the effect these relationships have on people and the efforts they're willing to go through to help each other out. If all you do is have everyone stand around the main character while they yell out, My, my friends, friends are my power, power, and they get a massive magical power up, you're doing it wrong. Another way to screw it up is by having it be a one-way street. If Joker went to jail after helping out all of these people and they just sat around doing nothing while Atlas still tried to make it some kind of power of friendship moment, it would run the risk of making everyone seem ungrateful. I could go on and on about this, but I feel like I'd be getting away from the point I'm trying to make. Basically, this sequence is great, it's incredibly rewarding, it's heartwarming, and while I understand why it's not included in the third semester, I still really miss it. As for Morgana waiting a month to come back, the excuse he gives is contrived, but honestly at this point I don't really care. It's a nice moment. In Royal, Psy still approaches Joker about turning himself in. However, a catchy walks up and offers to take him in instead. It would not only allow him to be the one to take down his father, but it would also allow him to atone somewhat. Does undoing the ambiguity of his death hurt the game? Personally, I don't know, but I like this scene regardless. Not only does it make complete sense both narratively and character-wise, but it acts as a solid first step towards atonement for Akechi. Also helps earn back some of the goodwill he lost with that bullshit he pulled. Instead of spending time in Juvie, Joker ends up spending Christmas and New Year's with his friends, holding two back-to-back get-togethers with everyone, and even inviting Kasumi to join them for the latter party. Morgana shows back up on Christmas instead of a month later, having revealed himself to Sojiro and being kept secret as a Christmas gift. As they all celebrate the coming New Year, I'm left thinking back on the entire experience of Persona 5. Vanilla Persona 5. This game is an incredibly important cornerstone in Atlas' history. It's the game that propelled them into the spotlight and has earned them the attention they have now. It's an incredibly well-made game that taught people the Atlas logo is a seal of quality. It was a massive boost to morale within the company, following their previous parent company, Index, going bankrupt and having to be sold off to Sega. This company would not be where it is today without this game. But does that mean it's the best game they've made? Not at all. Persona 5 does a lot right, but it also does a lot poorly. Its writing is uneven, and it suffers from pacing issues when it comes to balancing its story and its gameplay, a problem the series has suffered from ever since the invention of its calendar system. But even with that, it feels especially egregious here. There are times where the writing can end up undermining itself, doing things like arguing for people to stand up for the oppressed, while also using offensive gay stereotypes as a running gag where the punchline is, at best, they sexually harass Ryuji. Haru as a character is so poorly handled, and if it wasn't for spinoffs like Strikers, I wouldn't care about this girl in the slightest. However, what it does right, it does incredibly right. The main cast, for the most part, is really strong. Ryuji is probably my favorite bro in the series. An remains a positive force in spite of everything she goes through. Yusuke, while the most cartoonish of the cast, is very charming. Makoto is steadfast and loyal. Futaba is a very compelling character with a fantastic arc. I like Haru's personality, and Morgana, while not perfect, is certainly better than Teddy in my book. The story has its ups and downs, but thematically, I think it's one of the stronger narratives in Atlas's library. Gameplay is the best it's ever been in the Persona series. Combat is incredibly fun and super satisfying. Confidants are a fantastic renewal of social links, offering greater incentive for the player to want to do them while not compromising on what they are at their core. And, of course, we can't forget about the presentation. As I said all that time ago, if there's a single thing P5 is going to be influential for, it's going to be its UI and graphic design. This game is fun to look at, and it will never not be fun to look at. 
Persona 5 is a game that means a lot of things to a lot of people. To me, it's a game I really do like, but don't think I can say I love. For such a story-focused game, I find it to be too inconsistent for me to feel any stronger. However, no matter how my feelings might change or evolve, the one thing I can say about it is that I appreciate everything it did for one of my favorite developers, as well as the message it tries to put out in the world. Let me know what you thought of Persona 5 down in the comments below, and while you're there, leave a like, subscribe, and hit the bell to be notified of future uploads. I hope you guys have a happy New Year's. I'll be spending it with my friends getting drunk and getting loud. I'll see you next year where we finally make it to Royal's main attraction.